Greetings everyone, this is Jeff Wilkerson, Professor of Physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. This time we're talking about March 14th, 2022, and uh, this is for this week, but th this is one of these that is good for a long time. You can, for the rest of the spring, uh, you, can, you can apply what we're going to talk about here. It's a great, great thing we're talking about here today. Uh, we're going to talk about history of astronomy. We're going to talk about geometry. We're going to talk about measurement making. Uh, we're going to look at the constellation of Boethes. I don't think we've ever looked at Boethes in any serious way in one of these videos. So this is a lot of fun. I, I have a feeling it's going to last 30 or 40 minutes. We'll see how this goes. So anyway, um, we're, we're going to talk about William Herschel a, a, a little bit. And early on, as, when it was, as soon as we realized that... Uh, Kepler's version of the model of the solar system, the model of the known universe really at that time, uh, was, was better uh, at describing how things worked than was the Ptolemaic model or the Earth-centered model. It meant that the Earth should be moving in orbit around the Sun. And immediately people realized that if the Earth goes from here to here, if there are stars that are closer than more distant stars, they should look to move back and forth against those distant stars, something we would call trigonometric parallax. Okay, so we see this nearby star. Here you see this more distant star, it moves less. Most of the stars are so far away, they don't care that we're moving at all. They can't tell we're moving so little from side to side as we orbit the sun that it's such a small distance compared to the distance to the stars that we don't see most of the stars. They just don't move. We just don't see them jump back and forth. So this is a way to measure the distance to the nearest stars. And this is a great way to measure the distance to the nearest stars because it's just, it's just trigonometry. It's just geometry. Rock solid. If we know that distance uh, and we can measure that angle, for example, the angle that that thing shifted relative to more distant stars that don't shift, uh, and get this angle, boom, we apply our geometry, we apply our trigonometry, and we have the distance to that star rock solid. This is the first step in the cosmic distance ladder. Really, really, really important stuff. Uh, we've worked hard uh, over the centuries to try to measure this, to, to set the scale for the universe. And, and then models of other things are built on that. Anyway, it was a really hard measure to make because the nearest star is so far away that it's moving the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bit. So we can't really measure this thing. Uh, it, 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 took us, it took us a long, long time. It took us over 200 years from the time we started trying to measure this till the time we actually did measure trigonometric parallax. If you want to read more about that, uh, Alan Hirschfeld's book, Parallax, uh, The Race to Measure the Cosmos, is a fantastic read. Really, just a fantastic read. I don't know if it's in print right now, but you can probably find copies around even if it's not in print, and I recommend it really highly. The story of trying to measure this trigonometric parallax. In any event, um, one of the people who tried to do this was William Herschel. And in 1781, William Herschel was, he had, a, he had a plan, okay? It's good to have a plan when you go after this. And he thought, if I see two stars that are really close together, so that if I see them right next to each other, I might see one move relative to the other star. And that's the way I can measure this tiny, tiny, tiny little shift as we move from one side of the sun to the other. And if I pick two stars that are really close together and one is much brighter than the other, then I'll assume the fainter one is very, very far away compared to the brighter one. And I'll, I'll look for that brighter one to shift back and forth relative to that fainter one. This is a good plan, really good plan. He hatched a, he hatched a solid plan and started working on it. And in 1781, while he was looking at different double stars like this to try to see if he could measure this, he, um, he, he discovered Uranus, okay? So he, he, he did a, 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 it's great stuff. Um, but what happened is as he, as he continued this work over the years, over the decades, he realized that most of his stars weren't shifting back and forth. Most of them weren't moving at all relative to one another. But the ones that were moving relative to one another uh, weren't shifting back and forth, but instead looked like they were completing some sort of orbit. Uh, one of these st fate stars, so he's disgusted, right, that he's found binary stars. Now, these binary stars turn out to be a great, great find, because they take a long time to orbit around each other, but these, what we call visual binary stars like this, where we can see both components completing an orbit around one another, allow us to calculate the masses of these stars, and from this, we learn that its mass 
that drives temperature, apparent color of the stars. It depends on the mass of the stars, and it's the mass of the stars that drives the evolution of the stars. High mass stars evolve much more quickly than low mass stars. Our model of stellar structure, our model of stellar evolution is, is, is absolutely predicated. It's built on this observation that Herschel started, and the, the, these things that we can see are so take so long to complete an orbit, hundreds of years often, so that remember, he's doing this work at the end of the 1700s, a lot of these stars are just now completing one orbit, or haven't completed an orbit yet, or have completed one and a half or two orbits, and so this, these, this is just a treasure trove of, of data for us to be able to measure these stars. And so, um, to know this and to, to, to make models of how stars work, so these binary stars are just absolutely critically important to our, our history of understanding of stars. So what, what was that got to do with watching the sky? Well, I thought that this week, maybe what we would do is look at a few of these stars that Herschel first observed in the constellation Boethes. So, so first of all, if all you want to do is find Boethes, that's great. Uh, you got your Big Dipper up here, and we have the handle of the Big Dipper, and we like to say it arcs to the bright star Arcturus down here. So we follow the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper down to Arcturus. And Arcturus is really big, beautiful, bright stars. If you've been watching these videos, you know that most of the names of the stars are, are Arabic that we've been uh, working with. Arcturus is a uh, Greek name, and this is a name that is often translated as maybe uh, protector or keeper of the bear or some major up here. And so this is... is it's part of this grouping of stars, really big, bright, beautiful star. It's the first really bright star you come to if you follow the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper down here to Arcturus. Now, Arcturus is part of Boethes, and Boethes looks a little bit like this. Yeah, that's not part of it. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. I sometimes tell my students when we're in the planetarium, it looks like a, 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 a bag that I would carry around with me to pick up after the dog with the handle tied up here, there, and Arcturus is the knot in that bag. So we've got this, this bag that's out here, um, and so this sort of loop of stars, and they're pretty bright stars. So these are, these are decently bright stars that you can walk out and see, but they're not, Arcturus is spectacularly bright. They're pretty good and bright after that. Now, the stars that we're going to look at in here are binary stars that have many authors have attributed to other people discovering other than Herschel. And what I've looked at is, is a list. You can go online and look at a list. I think Bruce McAvoy in 2011 tried to had a project where he tried he tried to do was reestablish Herschel's list. And his claim would be that these stars were in fact discovered by Herschel as binary stars and were were, were part of this, uh, not others who came shortly after there. Uh, but our our point isn't that. Our point isn't uh, isn't about establishing priority for discovery. Uh, it, you know, it, it's great if you want to work on that and think about that. Our point is that there's a deep history with these stars that have really helped us understand the 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 understand stars and how they evolve and what they are in the sky. And they're just plain fun to look at. So the first of these we're going to look at is Epsilon. Epsilon. If you start with Arcturus. Uh, in the morning sky, right now. So you go out uh, in, in the in the evening sky. Excuse me. You go out in the evening sky. The Big Dipper. I tried to draw it standing straight up like this. And so Arcturus is skimming the northern horizon. Uh, for those of you at mid northern latitudes like myself, it's starting to climb up into the sky. And uh, you arc to Arcturus. And if you move along the horizon, if you move along to the west. Um, you come to Epsilon in this big, bright loop that you see right here as the first star. Epsilon is a binary star. Uh, the two stars are moving together in space, so we know they're associated in space. Uh, they're sort of yellowish and bluish, and they're separated by about three arc seconds, which means a, good, a, a decent telescope should pull those apart. You should be able to see those two stars, and one of them is, is 2.4 magnitude, uh, which is the bright star that you're seeing right there. And the other one is actually on the edge of, a, of, of a naked eye visibility. So it's also a good bright star at about fifth magnitude. And with three arc seconds of separation, this is a great test for your small telescope. Easy star to find if you just move from Arcturus along this loop uh, of Boethes along the horizon there right now. We haven't seen a move. Uh, there's, and, and so the period is, is, is more than that. The period's probably uh, more than, than, than several thousand years at least. Uh, so these things aren't moving very much relative to one another. So this is not one that we've been able to use to determine the mass of, the, of stars. But it is an interesting, pretty one to look at nonetheless. Now, down here, uh, if, if you go drop down from the handle, uh, the bottom of the, of the handle of the, of the bag I was talking about in Arcturus, sort of that triangle right there, uh, that star 
that you see in their Xi. So Xi Boetis is the star that's right here, and this is a spectacular star for you to observe. It has a period of about 150 years, so since the time Herschel would have been observing this, it has in fact completed more than one orbit and is in fact a star that helps us understand masses of, of, of stars and how they, that drives everything else about stars. Uh, 4.7th magnitude, so a naked eye star, but, but, but not bright. Uh, binoculars will help you pull it out and then find it with your telescope. And it's got a 7th magnitude companion. Uh, it varies. It's got an elliptical orbit, and it varies from 2 arc seconds to about 8 arc seconds. Remember, your fist at, at arm's length is about 10 degrees. 1 degree is 60 arc minutes. 1 arc minutes is 60 arc seconds. So these are pretty small separations. You need a telescope to do this. Uh, right now it's closing up, so don't wait 30 years to go out and do this observation. Do this observation right now, and it's I think it's probably about 4 arc seconds, 3 or 4 arc seconds separation, so about like epsilon right now. Uh, uh, but you, you can see these um, beautiful double star to go out and look at. Uh, Mu is, a, is another good star out here. And Mu, if you, if you go on from Epsilon to the next star out here in the bright loop, and then up to, the, to, to this star, uh, Mu forms a triangle like this out here. And Mu is a 4.3 magnitude star with a 6.5 magnitude companion. And so this is a... Um, this is a good, a good double star to see, too. Uh, look for color separation there. This one's tight. This one's tight. This one had better, better color distinction between the two, sort of yellow and red. This was yellow and blue. This was more yellow and red. This one's just hard to see because it's one to two arc seconds of separation. So just start to try to pull those stars apart. Uh, it has a period of about 260 years. So this is a star that's just getting close to completing an orbit from the time that Herschel would have been observing to allow us to measure these, these masses. So this is great, dripping in history, thinking about how we measure the universe, but just really pretty binary stars to look at. Double stars, uh, but actual binaries, actually orbiting around one another, and a chance to find the stars of Boetis if you don't know the stars of, of Boetis, and to get out there and look at it. So start with Arcturus, and then go to Epsilon, and, and see if you can take your small telescope and pull the components of Epsilon apart, and then see what you can do with Mu and Psi. Um, so that you've got these stars out here, uh, great double stars. Good luck with it, everybody. Have fun observing this week, and have a great week overall.